Hi, I'm Doug Grenick from Florin Court Capital. My talk is called Lessons from the Pandemic, Five Things You Need to Know Now. Are you suffering from COVID fatigue? A lot of us are. Of course, it could be that you have COVID, no wonder you're so fatigued, but it's more likely that you're exhausted by the daily inundation of virus news. So have no fear. This talk is not actually about COVID. It's about how to make better decisions under pressure. And decision-making in the real world is a tricky business. Almost every decision is easy if you have enough information. But many times we have limited information, and we have time pressure, which makes decision-making a branch of risk management. My background is as a mathematician. I studied differential topology, dynamics, and chaos theory at Berkeley, where I got my doctorate. But I also have a long background in biology. I've been a trader, portfolio manager, and risk manager for 30 years. And now I run a macro hedge fund. And a key aspect of my work, maybe the most key aspect, is trying to make consequential decisions under a lot of uncertainty. And we happen to have a very good case study to hand. I first learned about this virus around this time last year. And I saw a paper in The Lancet in late January. Title was, a novel coronavirus outbreak of global health concern. That was January 24th. This paper was done by some Chinese doctors, and they talked about a cluster of 41 pneumonia cases, mostly in middle-aged men without underlying conditions in Wuhan. And they saw some strange stuff. Uh, they st saw abnormal CT scans with what are called bilateral ground glass opacities, and these patients received incredibly sophisticated medical care. The kitchen sink was thrown at them. And yet, 13 had to go to the ICU and six died. So this paper was hair-raising and of great interest to me, both as a person in the financial markets and as someone very interested in biology. It's a dangerous pathogen. Six of 41 died. And the big question, at the time is, is there human to human transmission? And very quickly we found out that there is. And indeed, um, the co novel coronavirus is far more contagious than influenza and most other respiratory viruses. But take a look at this picture below. That's not lung tissue on the left normal, on the right COVID-19. This is cardiac tissue. We now know that COVID is a multi-system disease focusing a great deal on vascular tissue. Uh, by the way, as an aside, that Chinese data, six of 41 dying, that's not that different from our own. It looks a lot worse, but remember these were hospitalized patients. Here's a little flow chart of outcomes, uh, typical outcomes in this spring in the West. And you can have a look at that on your own time, but we must move forward. So what are the five principles and why only five? Well, five, because I'm doing a TED talk and I don't have a lot of time. And these are ones that I picked that are particularly important, but there are others. They may seem obvious, but using them in real life is not exactly common. Indeed, our current predicament, for example, in the UK and in the US, and in other places, stems in part from failing to apply these. So here's a preview. Number one, know when you don't know. Be open. Number two, focus on action as information. Watch what other people do rather than listen to what they say. Number three, listen to the people with firsthand experience rather than armchair and academic pundits who have not been out in the field battling outbreaks. Number four, use evidence even if it doesn't rise to the standard of proof. And think about decisions in sequence 
as paths, not in isolation. This last one is the most subtle. So the first one, know when you don't know. Now, Steven Seagal may not be famous for work in the philosophy of knowledge or in risk management, but this is one important maxim. Good one to remember. Assumptions are the mother of all F-ups. That's from under siege to dark territory. And if that's not good enough for you, we'll go to another Stephen, Stephen Hawking, saying essentially the same thing. The greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance. It's the illusion of knowledge. So who makes unwarranted assumptions? Everyone. You have to actively fight against it. Ask yourself, what if the initial idea you have isn't right? And here are some questionable assumptions about SARS-CoV-2 in the US and UK circa February 2020. Many people, including some experts, treated it as like the flu. It is nothing like the flu. The virus is entirely different, has a very different structure. The disease has a different pathophysiology and the outcomes have different mortality and morbidity rates. The flu is a meaningless and misleading comparison. Another idea was that it can't be eradicated or necessarily become endemic. We'll have to see on that, but the Chinese, Australians, and Koreans don't agree. Another idea was travel restrictions only delay the inevitable. In fact, the only those countries that have imposed travel restrictions have successfully managed the outbreak. We have the masks don't work except for healthcare workers where they're absolutely essential. Of course, it's nonsense uh, that they don't work. Uh, they are very important. And finally, we have the idea that democratic societies or countries that aren't islands uh, are incapable of responding decisively. And you have Australia, Korea, China, all doing a pretty good job. But you take assumptions like these and you get the mother of all F-ups. What's the correct stance? We don't know yet. Apply precautionary principles. What are precautionary principles? Plan for the worst, hope for the best. There are positive examples. I'm not going to talk about the negative examples and take political shots. Here are positive ones. Australia, Taiwan, New Zealand, Vietnam. And also I can point to doctors and researchers who were observant and open-minded. One comes to mind in particular. Uh, I, I was reading his post to social media back in, in, the, in the spring. His name is Dr. Cameron Kyle Siddle, and he's an intensive care MD in New York. And he went public with his concerns about ventilator use. And he posted, what I'm seeing is weird. And he talked about what he was seeing. Intensivists out there, critical care docs out there. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? Hit me up, let's compare notes, in so many words. And he raised important questions about the best way to use oxygen and ventilators and actually his stance that evolved from this, from his openness, changed the standard of care in many places. This is a guy with the right kind of attitude. Lesson number two, watch actions. Here's a quote, a great quote, but he didn't say it. Uh, Winston Churchill didn't say it. I no longer listen to what people say, I just watch what they do. Here's another quote which I like, figure out who has the best information, then watch what they do. Uh, if somebody said it before me, uh, they get credit, but I've said it. Anyhow, who knew the most circa February 2020? Who should we be watching? Well, the Chinese. So what were the Chinese doing in February 2020? Strict lockdowns travel restrictions, the building out of hospital capacity. They trialed treatments with repurposed drugs 
and they adopted the goal of zero COVID. COVID is not something, as we have learned, that you can live with. It's like playing footsie with a crocodile. What did Chinese actions tell us for focusing on what they were doing? Let's compare what they were doing in February with the sort of messaging that I heard here. In February, the Chinese are locking down, but at first, at first it was 35 million, then more people, essentially all of Hubei province and other parts of the country. Meanwhile, uh, our, our approach was to advise people to please sneeze into tissues. The Chinese actions showed that they saw the virus as a grave threat. They had the most information that was a message to the rest of the world. Watch what they did. So now we come to lesson number three, prioritizing firsthand experience. So I am not an expert on virology. I know a fair bit, but I don't compare with the people who have made a career of virology. And you may be in a position where you have to make decisions about something, form a view on something, and you're not an expert in the field. Whom should you listen to when different academic voices are coming at you? It's really very simple. You go with battlefield experience. You go with people, in this case, who have been involved in outbreak control in similar kinds of epidemics in the past. For example, Mr. Guan Yi, Dr. Guan Yi in Hong Kong. This is a guy who was involved in managing the SARS epidemic in Asia. He's been involved in important outbreaks all over the place. And his comment in January, and this was actually before the Lancet article that I, I showed you, his comment was it could be 10 times worse than SARS. Remember, SARS was uh, an outbreak of a lethal respiratory coronavirus, uh, I think in 2003 and four. He also commented that he's seen it all and this time he's petrified. Then you go to a different part of the world with some armchair experts who advise this is not something to panic about. Actually, I, panic may be the wrong word, but this is something to take strong action about. Listen to people like Guan Yi, who have been in the field. And this applies whatever the problem, go with battlefield experience. As I mentioned, the SARS epidemic provided the experience that allowed many Asian countries to do a much better job than the Western countries in managing the virus, despite the fact that it started there and despite back there, very high population density, multi-generational living, a whole range of factors that should have made it worse. Taiwan has very close links to mainland China these days, and Taiwan has successfully pursued a zero COVID strategy. China's achievements in public health have been remarkable. Singapore has done well. The, and this is largely because of the lessons learned in the prior epidemic, back to my point on experience. So why weren't the experienced Asian experts heard in January? That is a big, that's a big question for me. Is this an example of prejudice? You know, I leave that question open, but they're the people who had the experience that would have been most valuable to our understanding. So as you know, from my background, I'm a quant. So where does quantitative modeling come into all this? People like Neil Ferguson. And my comments are this, the more novel the situation, the less useful quant modeling is because it requires good information for good output. But it can provide important qualitative insights where intuition is poor. And a good example of this is when you're dealing with exponential processes. People can't comprehend exponential processes. Uh, I'm a mathematician, I can't. I'm pretty sure you can't. Let's, uh, you've heard of the wheat in the chessboard problem. You got a chessboard and you have a grain of wheat. Put one grain on the first square. Double that for the second square. Double that for the third square. So now you're up to like four grains, right? Keep doubling each time. 
And finally, you're done with the 64 squares. How much wheat do you have? Do you have thousands of grains? No. Millions? No. You have 18 quintillion. It, beyond trillions. It's just a, a vast number. Exponential processes get away from you so quickly. And that's relevant to this epidemic. So models can help you recognize what really matters qualitatively, even if in the beginning of an epidemic, you may not have enough information to estimate the details of the model. Qualitatively, a 50% increase in transmissibility, like the new variant, is much worse than a 50% increase in lethality. So here's a good use of quant. So the reproduction number of a virus in a population refers to the number of people that an infected person on average will infect. So R equals 0 0.9 means that an infected person infects 0 0.9 others on average. Think of that as 10 infected people creating nine more infections. Now, if you change R by just 0.4, you go from, let's say, an R of 0 0.9 to an R of 1.3, you go from a dwindling outbreak to explosive growth. That's, that's a good use of modeling because our intuition doesn't suggest anything like the drama that you see on that graph. My fourth lesson is you need to understand that evidence is a continuum. It's not yes, no, but more versus less. So here is an outpatient COVID-19 kit from India. It contains some vitamins. It contains an oximeter. It also contains some medications, okay, that uh, the Indian government deems effective enough to dispense to people and safe enough to dispense to people. So does this kit work? The proof is not definitive. But there's obviously some positive evidence associated with uh, the supplements and medications and limited downside. It's kind of benefit versus risk. And the Indian government, given their circumstances, has made the decision in certain states to dispense this. So what's the right standard? How much evidence do you need? Why don't you have a kit? What, what's the standard that applies here? And that takes us into a debate in medicine, EBM, evidence-based medicine, versus traditionalists. Actually, everybody's in favor of evidence. It's just an evidence-based medicine, a, a, a very, very high priority is placed on what's called gold standard evidence, randomized clinical trials. Traditionalists like those two but they're willing to consider other things, mechanism of action, observational studies, clinical experience. From my perspective, we're in a risk management issue. And I'm not outside the mainstream of, of medical thinking. The modern version of the Hippocratic Oath recognizes this trade-off. You should read the, uh, the modern version. It's very, very beautiful. So, uh, you know, it'll make you want to become a doctor, frankly. It's a very high calling indeed. But there are two kinds of errors to balance. There's type one, now we're in statistics, errors of omission. There are type two, errors of commission. Errors of omission is you don't do something good. You don't send out a COVID kit when you should have. Errors of commission is when you do something bad. You send out a kit that has bad side effects and injures people. Commission, omission, t uh, type, uh, type one and type two errors. So is evidence-based medicine, which, is, which has become in a way the orthodoxy in some Western countries too much of a good thing from a risk management standpoint? I don't know, I don't know. Certainly, it's, it's, it's helped medicine a great deal in many contexts, but pandemics require quick responses. And type one errors can be as bad as type two errors, but they're less visible. The thing you didn't do 
but could have helped is less visible than an active mistake. Now, a risk management principle that is very important is that uncertainty must be balanced at an optimal point. You're supposed to be equally uncomfortable. Did I do too much? Did I do too little? If you're sure you haven't done too much, you probably haven't done enough. And if you're sure you haven't done too little, you've probably done too much. It's, it's an idea that I've taught traders who have worked with me that you're supposed to be sort of equally uncomfortable with, with have I been too aggressive? Have I been not aggressive enough? Because when there's a lot of uncertainty, you don't know. If it's one-sided, it, it, it sort of means you're favoring one kind of error over another, and the optimum is in balance. So the, here's a risk management perspective from Robert Rubin, a uh, very prominent guy in finance, very smart guy. Uh, all decisions are based on imperfect or incomplete information, but decisions must be made and on a timely basis. The business I was in for 26 years was all about making decisions in exactly this way, indeed. Finally, my last lesson is to think about strategy as decision paths, not as a single decision, because your choices now will determine your options and choices later. Play the tape forward under different scenarios. Now here I will make a literary allusion one of the great writers, Cormac McCarthy. And here's uh, a quote from the El Jefe speech. Um, it's a very, very fine piece of literature. Uh, you should have a look at it. Actions create consequences which produce new worlds. The world in which you seek to undo the mistakes that you made is different from the world where the mistakes were made. And you wanna choose, but there is no choosing there. There's only accepting. The choosing was done a long time ago. So he's referring to the fact that the choices you make now will determine the choices you have later. And this has implications. Let's apply it here. The easy application is to understand how important it is to stay ahead of the curve. It's not hard to ease up if things are well controlled. New Zealand, China, and Korea have lots of options. If you lose control, things happen fast. Exponential growth. Remember the wheat and chessboard problem? And you're on the back foot and you have few options. You have a healthcare system that will be overrun. You're gonna to have to lock down and do things that you, you don't want to have to do. You gotta stay ahead of the curve and keep things under control, tight control, or you run out or you have few options. So here are my points again. Know when you don't know, which is usually. Be open, even to things you don't want to hear. Take the emotion out of the picture. Figure out who has the best information right now and watch what they do. First-hand experience usually beats cleverness in math, although there's a role for those. You have to act without imperfect information. It's uncomfortable, get, but get used to it. Know about balancing the kind, the two types of errors, too much versus too little. Draw out decision trees and choose those paths that give you options later and leave room to maneuver as you learn more. And as you, can, as you think about these things, you can see various policymakers around the world applied or did not apply these principles. And there were major consequences to the choices. And then last, and certainly not least, here are some top sources on the pandemic. If you really want to know what's going on, these scientists are uh, really excellent. If you want to go in very deep, you don't want to miss the upcoming episode of This Week in Virology. The, their podcasts are always very informative uh, if you want to learn more about this stuff. And thank you for your time and good luck making decisions.